Welcome to the 372nd episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Bart Costco, author of the novel Cool Earth. Stay tuned for the interview. The Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro.fm lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 185,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there, but you'll be part of a different story, one that supports your local community and your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. You can listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best your local bookseller. Here's your special offer from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Get two audiobooks for the price of one today with your first month of membership with the code RWPODCAST at checkout. This offer is only valid for new members in Canada and the U.S. Check out Libro.fm today. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Bart Costco, author of the new science fiction novel, Cool Earth. In addition to writing Cool Earth, Dr. Costco is a professor of electrical engineering and law at the University of Southern California and one of the acclaimed founders of the machine learning fields of fuzzy logic and neural networks. He also has written a previous science fiction novel, uh, Nanotime, a cyber thriller novel about World War III that was nominated for the Prometheus Book Award. Bart, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here, Jeff. Great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about Cool Earth yet, how would you describe your new novel? It's a real-time thriller. So if you thought of it as a movie that lasts two hours, well, the two hours of the movie are the two hours of the drama. But as the name suggests, it's about cooling the earth. And it comes from an idea I had many years ago. It goes like this. What if global warming gets so bad as it could? You cross certain tipping points, and if the attempts to cool, a variety of attempts are available, fail, or just don't work enough, then what if you actually moved, Jeff, the earth a little farther away from the sun to cool it? In theory, you could do that as a kind of big solar system-based engineering project, and you could also move it back in the other direction towards the sun if things got colder, like in the returning ice age. But it's the nature of these things that you've got, you'd have to get the science right to many, many decimal places. Essentially impossible to do that. And a little bit of fuzz, a little bit of grayness in there can lead to some crazy chaotics and catastrophe could ensue. So that's the idea. What about if we move the earth to cool it and then somebody gets the crazy idea to move it back? And so what would be the engineering um, behind that of actually moving the earth? Ah, so how would you achieve the finger of God? Of course, this is the big reveal. The answer is repeated reverse gravity catapults about the moon. So you can think about it this way. When we send a space probe to Mars or further out in the solar system, we usually have it go around Jupiter, say. And when it does that, it steals a little bit of the energy and momentum from Jupiter and speeds up its trajectory. Uh, The price paid is that Jupiter slows down in its orbit a little bit, maybe a meter or two uh, over a period of uh, 10 million years or something. Now, imagine if you change the scale of these things. So instead of Jupiter, you had the moon, which is vastly smaller. And instead of a tiny space probe like the Viking probe going around it, you had something much bigger like an asteroid. There's lots of them out there that we can grab and use in the asteroid belt. Then you could substantially over time, 
slow down, in effect, the movement of the moon around the sun, the earth and moon are coupled together very closely. And conversely, if you went the other direction around the moon, you could give energy from the asteroid, transfer it to the moon, to the earth-moon system. So that's sometimes called a gravity break. But the result would be that the asteroid would slow down over time. But this energy and momentum is always conserved. Just like when you see an ice skater spinning and he or she lowers arms to the side, it speeds up. That's a conservation of angular momentum. And that same way, you could transfer energy and momentum to the Earth-Moon system. It would slightly over time move out away from the sun. And in theory, Jeff, on average, you could cool the Earth that way. Uh, I say on average because a lot can happen on an average. There's a lot of bounce. And I like to think of that proverbial statistician who drowned in a lake that was only 12 inches deep on average. It's that kind of thing. But you could cool the temperature, say, a Celsius, one degree Celsius. Uh, on the other hand, in the course of doing that, like in the novel, Europe may freeze and the Hoover Dam may break and a lot of other things could happen. But in principle, you could cool it by moving away from the sun. Wow. Well, as you explain, your novel Cool Earth takes place 60 years from now and life on Earth is threatened by global warming. We're currently living through a global pandemic. Are there any connections or similarities to these? There are in a variety of ways, but in the first one, it's just this sense of disaster. And can we achieve a collective decision making like everyone wearing masks or social distancing or doing something that is in the global good or the communal good, but may not be in your own selfish good. This has always been the problem with any form of government. And the pandemic shows first in the United States that you can't just do this in a city or a state. It affects the whole country. It further shows that these countries affect one another. And what we don't have, and I'm not advocating for, but we don't have a world government. I mean, you think we have politics now, Jeff. Can you imagine between Russia and the United States and China what that would be like, jockeying for power? But that would, in principle, be a way to achieve that. In the same way, and it's much more difficult when it comes to global warming and the different kinds of hazards it will create, uh, because with the pandemic, the costs and benefits are relatively short term. With global warming, we're pushing the cost deep into the future. We are all technically free riding, as economists say, on future generations. Plus, we have the free riding that takes place between different countries and among different countries. So, for example, the United States has been reducing its carbon footprint, footprint its global emissions, whereas China has been greatly increasing them. And there's always this issue. It's trying to reduce them, I should say, China, but it has been increasing them. There's this issue that China can just say, look, uh, you guys go ahead and do the hard work, whether it's carbon reduction or something else, to reduce global warming on your end, and we'll just take the benefit, benefit and free ride from that. So you get a double form of free ridership with global warming. The immediate issue of one country takes mitigation steps and the other takes none or, or fewer. And then this overall problem that we have of simply kicking it down stream to the future. Now we do that in a variety of ways, but when we're, we're burning on the order of a hundred million barrels of oil a day, that's a lot of carbon going up in the atmosphere. It's going to stay there for a long time with really unknown effects other than an average, average warming at some point that's happening. Another thing that we're doing, these are all forms of pollution is, is putting millions of tons of plastics into the ocean. By the way, China is by far the biggest doer of that. And then I think after that is Indonesia. And again, in the short term, it's difficult to coordinate that. In the longer term, well, again, you're kicking that downstream. These plastics don't go away. In fact, they deteriorate. And we find increasingly plastic and nanoparticles and fish and a variety of other things. So the pandemic in many way, ways is a warm-up for attempts to coordinate worldwide. It's to me far from clear, Jeff, that our current schemes 
whether the United Nations or otherwise are sufficient for that. I mean, it's far from clear, if you want to stand back as a social scientist, whether democracy itself scales. That's why it's interesting to watch the difference between the two biggest countries, India and China. India is the biggest democracy in the world with a lot of problems and not very good infrastructure. And China, of course, is an autocracy, but with a lot better infrastructure and a better ability to achieve let's say, if it wanted to, environmental regulation, not advocating for autocracy, but it's it's the world we're in. True. Well, I know you're a distinguished professor at USC of not only computer and electrical in- engineering, but also law. How did that inform your writing of Cool Earth? In many ways, uh, when Cool Earth, you described it, which is correct, as quote-unquote science fiction, but it's that in the literal sense and that it's a drama, a very tough real-time drama. Hey, it's the end of the world. And when you write something like that, you have to try to get the facts right. Now, because it takes place in the future, uh, there's a fair amount of extrapolation. This is not a science fantasy novel. And part of that extrapolation has to do with what the law will look like. But on this point more generally, Jeff, if you took a current contemporary novel, a romance novel, a crime thriller, the facts in that novel about the internet, telephone calls, airplanes, would appear as science fiction 100 years ago, even though they're just part of the background causal structure of the story. When we get to something like global warming attempts and mitigation in the future, uh, Part of that, as I just said, is this international coordination effort. And one of the things you can do is is simply reflect some of the sunlight back. And you don't have to do it worldwide. You can do it at the North and South Poles. You can do it in hot spots, for example, out in the Mojave Desert, at least as an experiment. But if you do that, there will be foreseeable or arguably foreseeable downstream consequences for people in that country and for other countries. So there's a litigation effect. But more than that, and the story itself, which is a very personal story. I'm just giving you the big in causal background. In that story, uh, there are very bad acting teenagers, the result of designer children, the ability to manipulate the genomes, not just of ourselves, but of our offspring. Now, will that be possible under the law? I think so, in the sense that the U.S. Supreme Court has recognized a very broad so-called fundamental right of reproduction. And part of that has, a good part of that has been involved in the legalization of abortion and gay rights and many other things. But very soon we'll be confronted with the issue of whether a child has to have two parents. A child could have three or more. So how could that be? The reason is a child statistically is an average of the parent's genome. And once you can manipulate the genome, once you can search for alternative or improved genomes, well, you just open up the Pandora's box there. I think the last thing that happens is the law catches up. The ability to manipulate your genes, in particular your offspring's genes, I think will be something that takes place initially on the black market, We have what's called the CRISPR technology out there now. Initially, for the best of intentions, as is usually the case with technology, to reduce, for example, possible forms of cancer, other health effects. But you know what's going to happen, Jeff. People are going to want to design themselves, and at least partially, in their offspring to look better, stronger, and the like. And there'll be a lot of unintended consequences to that, and I think eventually law will catch up. That's one example. There's many others, like, for example, patents. We live in a tech world that's largely driven by patent technology, which is an odd form of government monopoly on ideas, a form of ideas, intellectual property. Will patents really persist into the future? I don't think they will, not because of ideological reasons. There's lots of them on the left and the right, people who don't like patents, but simply because in the patent law, You can't get a patent if your invention is obvious to someone of, quote, ordinary skill in the art. And that will quite likely include 
computer support systems or computers, AI systems themselves. In other words, it'd be very difficult to come up with something that isn't obvious to a vastly smarter computer than we have today. So I think that will go away. And that affects the story. But a key one is this business about designing your genes, modifying your genes. So here's a consequence of that. Let's suppose parents A and B or A, B, and C want to not just combine their genomes to produce an offspring uh, in an average weighted way, but they want to add in the genome, at least part of it, of the latest celebrity. Let's pick on Tom Cruise. Now, Tom Cruise have a, has a legal right of publicity. And I'm sure he'll have more rights as this goes downstream. And on the one hand, he could intercede to stop, I would think, someone from, in effect, creating children based on his genome or an approximation of his genome. On the other hand, it's not hard to imagine, especially if you've ever met with a Hollywood talent agent, that at least some celebrities could, quote unquote, monetize some of their image and license portions of their genome or portions of, of themselves, if you like. And even those are all uh, possibilities for the future. And I think we'll confront them very quickly when we have gotten to the point of programming genomes as easily as we can program software. We're not there yet, but we're getting very close to that. We also have very powerful search algorithms in computer systems looking to give us low-cost solutions. Well, a low-cost solution would be a genome, a version of you, that is much less likely to get cancer or Parkinson's disease or things like that. And that requires an immense amount of search. And the most likely candidate for that is something called quantum annealing. It's a form of quantum computing. If you're interested, you can go to my webpage. I just published a paper on it, Physical Review, in November. And in fact, USC is filing a patent on some quantum annealing. So these sorts of issues, the law of patents, uh, the nature of identity, of reproduction, and the effect you have on your neighbors locally and globally are all legal issues. And so it's a natural thing to do to speculate on that, just as, we, as I do with the different technologies involved, likely in 2080 for vision and memory and recall and, and space-based engineering. Great. Well, what are your earliest memories of reading in books? Well, that's a tough one. I, I, for me, I tried to write a book before I could write. And it was, I think, between ages three and four. My brother and I were very much into rockets. This is the very early 60s. We were in the space race with the Russians. And my father showed us how to launch what are called Estes rockets. <clears throat> I don't even know if that's still possible or legal. And I started sketching a book on rockets, on how to assemble them and launch them, in other words, and ba did it basically in the form of a storyboard. And finally, I learned, I guess I was five of the usual books, see John, see John with the wagon, and I picked up reading very quickly. Uh, I, because I was the youngest in the family, Jeff, I did start to read more advanced books early. I remember I read the Godfather book right after it came out, and it made an impression on me. I just didn't understand the, the pulp aspects of it. And I remember being extremely disappointed when I, when I saw the movie. And then I also, at the local school I was at, would check out for a while there, checking out a book a day. And began to devour books. I don't know when that, that really happened, but it did happen. And it was, for me, a, well, it was a real period of growth. I always liked that active mental component, almost like a meditation, like a focused meditation when a reader engages with an author, as opposed to passive learning that we do now so routinely online and with movies. But it made a very big difference. And by the time I was 10 or so there with the family, we were checking out an awful lot of books at the local library. And 
to this day. In fact, I'm sitting now surrounded by a pile of books, but it's been a big part of my life ever since. It's just, I, I want to say, as I implied here with response to your question about the legal conjectures in the book, uh, to me, uh, it's important to read in all directions and as a an author to write in all directions. And so, as I said, I have a recent paper in the journal Physical Review, this novel, finishing up another novel, I've written textbooks, articles, and in many different directions. And so it took a while to learn the language of science and mathematics. But I've long since been able to read those books pretty much like, not like a novel, but like a, an ordinary nonfiction book. And just as an aside, if if you're a math phobe out there listening, I think you might give it another shot. We don't teach math and science, in my opinion, very well at the K-12 through level. I'm not knocking the teachers there. It's just a tradition that we have. It comes out of the 19th century. And there are a lot better ways to learn it now. You can go online and watch a Khan Academy video, for example. I wouldn't give it up. In fact, I would rec- recommend to someone when schools get back into regular session, you might at some point take a, an extension course on even calculus or, or introduction to calculus or pre-calculus or something like that. If you can count your money, you can do modern math. It'll take a while, and it's a language. It's very much like learning the language of music or anything else. And somewhere for me, Jeff, all that started with trying to write a book And now on stay tuned for a short excerpt Great. from the well, audio book. What writing of advice before would you, you offer go for listeners by who Tommy are writing Butler, their own stories and novels? Narrated by George Newbern. Published by Harper <laughs> now, Audio. I come out of the world of music. And available wherever audio books are sold. And so I view the novel as a fully orchestrated work. So I have a very odd background, but I got to USC where I'm long since been a professor on a music scholarship, a music composition scholarship after winning some awards. And what you learn in writing music, which is very difficult to do, is you first sketch it. You have to come up with that nugget, that basic idea of melody, something you want to sing or hum in the shower. And you think about it, you work it, and then you have to convert that ultimately into, well, technically into an equation, but to a system of frequency, several instruments, and there's many different ways to do that. But the classic way to do that, and I started out, I was lucky enough to study film composing with the great film composer David Raxon, who scored the movie Laura, if you ever saw that old war movie. But you write a piano sketch, or assuming you can play the piano, approximate the sounds on the piano, you work at that, you think about that, and it gets in your brain, in your synapses. And then at some point, you orchestrate. Now, the actual film composer, by the way, is usually so busy at the end of the film process that he or she has to turn it over to orchestrator. Most of that film music you hear was not fully written by the composer, but as a as an author, and I mean also in a nonfiction case, but certainly for fiction, I think you want to sketch your drama. You don't have to over outline it. You certainly want to have the rough contours of it, but some form of it. It might even be a good idea to talk it out to somebody or to write it out. But when it comes to the word smithing of the paragraphs and the chapters, that I think you should view as orchestration. You really have to know where you're going. And analogy, and a pretty good one, I think, is a blueprint for a house or a building. And my father, by the way, was a, a building contractor. Now he used to watch in fascination as a little boy as he would sketch houses and go out and build them. It's that kind of thing. Of course, you change the house in the course of building it somewhat, just as you do any work of art or nonfiction when you write it. But I think you have to have a pretty good plan. And even if you just crash through it, as some authors do, knock out that first draft, that is itself a kind of house that you build. you got to go back and rethink that. I think that's a tougher way to do it. So my advice is to come up with the equivalent of a piano sketch, at least the main points. And, and one more way to think about that. Take a common piece of music like the Star Spangled Banner 
or your favorite your favorite song and think how you would arrange that for five brass instruments or if you have a classical background for a string quartet just how would you do that and you could take a very simple theme or how would you do it for a full orchestra even if you don't know how to Right for orchestra, you could sketch it. You could say, I want the winds doing something here and a harp doing this at this moment and so forth. And that's where you're going to go. And there's many different ways to go with that. And when you sit down to actually write out the first draft or the final draft or the 50th draft here, uh, one question is, would that draft really be different had I done it on a different day? And I think quite often the answer is yes. I'm the kind of writer, Jeff, who goes over it so many times that I think the answer in my case is no. And so I've worked on it. I've thought about it. In the case of Cool Earth, it grew out of a short story I published many, many years ago and had a chance to think about and develop and going hiking out. I live out in the mountains outside of Los Angeles, which are a stand-in for the Mount Whitney setting of the novel Cool Earth, and went over in my head, I would dream about the characters, get to know them. And then when I wrote the first draft and other drafts, the orchestration, I came back to it. It is what I would call invariant. I just got to the point where I couldn't change it anymore and then still set it aside and then came back all the other revisions that go on and iterations with agents and editors and things like that. So I take a long time in doing that. That may be more than <laughs> most authors do. But I I think it's a, a practical way to do it. My last point on this, to take a musical analogy again, is when you come up with a musical idea, you have to ask yourself, at least I did as a young composer, is this big enough for a string quartet? Is this only good enough for a violin and piano sonata? Would it work for a small orchestra, or do I have something that's big enough, substantial enough, that would justify a symphony? If you're writing a novel, I think the answer should be it should be at the symphonic level. It's got to be big, not in a plot premise, but in terms of, in your mind, a result. Otherwise, it, it might be best to just to keep it first at the level of a short story. We'll come back to it later. So what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Hmm. You know, the nonfiction books <laughs> I've read, I was just reading a, a new take on differential topology, and I don't think that's, that's what you <laughs> meant. But I did read a, a very good book on warming that came out the same day, June 30th of mine, called Apocalypse Never. And it's... It's a book about trying to be rational about the real risks of global warming, not to be an alarmist. Some people are alarmist, I think, to spur the world to action, and but there are costs to doing that kind of thing. So I, I did enjoy that. But I am finishing up another novel right now, a, a much bigger work than Cooler Earth, and I spent a lot of time on it. And Jeff, when I do that, I don't like to read other novels. It will definitely have an effect. A lot of my research has been on the mathematics of the brain, fuzzy logic, and on learning laws and how things like that. And we know that the brain's affected even by a single photon of light. You're certainly affected by what you watch, by what you read. So I think it's a very risky business for an author when he or she is orchestrating, in the sense I just said, really doing the wordsmithing of the final or near final or penultimate versions of a novel to be reading someone else's novel. Sure. I, I would I would save that till later. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? You can just go to my website at USC or type in the name Bart Costco. I do post a lot of content there. And for the first time, I've posted some videos of some technical talks at the big artificial intelligence conference actually we had last week. Anomaly in Glasgow, Scotland, but it was all done by Zoom. And there are links there to the books and to different kinds of essays and op-eds. Like I say, I write a lot of things. And uh, each 
piece of content there is what I consider a result, just like I consider a cool earth result. I thought it was a pretty good idea earlier on. It began as a short story. I tell the story in the preface to the novel that I got some assistance from the great science fiction writer, Sir Arthur Clarke. And so I dedicated the novel to him. And I thought there was enough substance there over time that it, it did evolve all the way out to a novel, to a real-time novel, which, by the way, Jeff, is part of something a writer has to address with a novel of when do you start the story and when do you end it? And I think the answer to that is you start as late as possible. What the old silent filmmakers used to call burn the first reel, in the sense that you can walk into a movie and kind of catch it or, and pick it up. And then you end it as soon as possible. Start as late as possible end as soon as possible. The other problem I have in general with drama is the time break. When the characters in the character web take a pause, go to sleep, a leap ahead six months. And I think the tighter you can bring that drama down almost to a stage play, the, well, the better it is and the more realistic it is. And the logical limit of that is a real-time story. It's not easy to do, and it takes a great deal of planning, I think, to have it worked out. If you just think about movies, there aren't many real-time movies you can think of. High Noon was one. Dr. Strangelove was Kubrick's real-time movie. And Rope was Hitchcock's movie. Uh, you have to have all your ducks in a row in order to do that. But it's something that, something to think about. I know the screenwriters in Hollywood will go out of their way to take the so-called time lock. If it's four days of a story to try to reduce it to two and something like that. But in any event, Cool Earth, the, the novel, the short story was published many years ago. Novel is available and there's a link to it. For example, on my webpage, also to my other books, including previous nonfiction books like Fuzzy Thinking and Heaven in a Chip. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Dr. Bart Costco, author of the new novel, Cool Earth. The novel is available now, as he just mentioned. So go buy a copy. And Bart, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you, Jeff. Enjoyed it. Great. Thanks a lot. 